Welcome back to the series ISNAV Stories. Um, today we are with uh, Professor Claudio Pellegrini, uh, Professor Emeritus at UCLA, and currently at SLAC, National Accelerator Laboratory in Stanford. Benvenuto, Claudio. Thank you. So Claudio has um, a laurea in Fisica from La Sapienza in Rome. And after working at uh, Laboratori Nazionali di Frascati for high energy and nuclear physics, and at the Nordic Institute for Theoretical Physics in Copenhagen in 1978, uh, he moved to the United States to work at Brookhaven National Lab and then became professor at, um, of physics at UCLA in 1989. In 2017, Claudion has been elected to the National Academy of Science, and in 2015, he received the um, Enrico Fermi Award from President Obama um, for a pioneering research advancing understanding of relativistic electron beams and free electron lasers, and for transformative discoveries profoundly impacting the successful development of the first hard X-ray free electron laser, heralding a new area for science. So I heard you saying that uh, President Obama asked you what an X-ray free electron laser is. So my first question for you is how did you answer him? Okay. Um, what I told him is that it's, uh, it's, it's a new way to look at the structure and the interaction of matter at the level of atom and molecules. Up to uh, the time when the X-ray free electron laser started to operate here at SLAG, it was not really possible to explore atomic and molecular phenomena and the characteristic times in which their interaction take place and the characteristic dimension, length scale on which they take place. There are two important numbers when you want to study atomic and molecular science, which is very important because this is where the, the life is, all the life on Earth is dominated by atomic phenomena and molecular phenomena. So it's interesting, it's exciting to really understand better these things, to understand better life around us. And uh, these two characteristic uh, scales, uh, one in length and one in time, are the, for the scale, the size of the atom which is about one angstrom. It's one tenth of a billionth of a meter, 10 to the minus 10 meters. And for the time uh, is one femtosecond. One femtosecond is the time it takes one electron. If you look at, at an atom, you have the nucleus and then you have electrons around it. And if you take one of the external el electrons, the valence electrons in the jargon, uh, the one that are mostly responsible for the interaction between the atoms, uh, the time it takes for this electron to make a circle around the uh, nucleus, like the time it takes the Earth to make a circle around the sun, that's one year. It's an important number. And uh, uh, for the case of an electron, it's one femtosecond. So what is one femtosecond? One femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So it's one millionth of a billionth of a second. It's a very, very short time. These electrons mm -hmm. are very fast and uh, uh, the atom is small, so it doesn't take that long to to make a circle around it, the revolution time, it's, uh, it's not the long. So uh, until the X-ray free electron laser uh, was developed, we were able to look at matter 
atomic and molecular phenomena. On the scale uh, length of one angstrom, we were able to see atoms, but over a long time. So uh, we couldn't follow the motion of an atom. You could see the atom, but we couldn't follow what happened to it during inter interaction with other atoms. Mm -hmm. And it was possible to look at atoms on a fast scale, even one femtosecond. So look at the dynamics at the motion, but not with the resolution of one angstrom. So we could either see small things over a long time scale or fast things, fast phenomena, but over a large size. With the operation of the X-ray, the invention of the X-ray field electron laser, we could do these two things together. So for instance, one thing that we can do now and it wasn't possible to do before, is to look at a chemical reaction following what happens in a chemical reaction on a time scale of, of femtoseconds and on a length scale of angstrom. So one experiment that has been done is LAC is to take one molecules, uh, which is a ring of uh, six carbons with hydrogen atom around it and something else. And this is present in our vision system. If you hit this molecule with a photon, with light, uh, it will change structure. So it will go from an hexagonal structure to a linear structure. And with the X-ray field electron laser, you can see how this process takes place. You, so you can see when the photon arrives, the six uh, carbon atoms start to move and you can follow the motion in detail. And how they rearrange over 30 femtosecond to reach the final state where they have this different structure. So this different structure has an effect on uh, our vision. So it makes possible to look at the phenomena, molecular phenomena in this case, uh, which are also important for us for understanding in detail vision in this case. Uh, in real life, it's like having a video camera with a video camera, you can look at people moving and you can follow their motion of a fraction of a second. And you can see objects on the scale of centimeter or meters. Perfect for that. So we can see action, interaction between people. Uh, you can see a soccer game with people uh, kicking each other and so on and so forth. And, with this uh, X-ray field electron laser, it's like having a video camera in which you can see atoms as they interact, as they move around during the interaction. And so how they go from some initial state to some final state, how they change and what happens during this change. And this, uh, seeing what happens during the change was not possible before, but we can do it now. So it gives a way to look at dynamical processes in molecular atomic processes uh, in a way which was not possible before. So that's why it's interesting. And following up on that, I would like you to comment on your more recent work at Slack, where you are called the patriarch of uh, L L S L S L no and L C L. <laughs> LCLS. 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 So tell us about that and how, and I quote, um, it has transformed science as a push boundaries in countless areas of discovery. Well, uh, 
I mean, I'm the bachelor because I'm old. <laughs> but, no, but you uh, were instrumental. In, uh, in the, yeah. uh, I started uh, working on X-ray field electron laser in the 70s and 80s, so a long time ago, uh, when I still was at uh, Frascati and then continued uh, to work on these uh, instruments in this, on these systems when I moved to Brookhaven and then to UCLA. And during all of this time, I also had a collaboration with Slack, uh, which goes really back to the 60s when we were doing other work. I was at Frascati and the work that we were doing there, uh, this collider for energy physics to study elementary particles were being developed for the first time at Frascati. And there was a lot of interest here. And in fact, they followed what we did at Frascati here at Slack. Um, so in uh, 1982, I made a proposal at Slack. Uh, sorry, in, uh, when was it? In 1992. Okay. I made a proposal at Slack. We had done a, a lot of uh, theoretical work. I was also collaborating with other physicists in Italy in that field. And uh, at the UCLA, I was building small prototype on a much smaller scale of an, X, an X-ray free electron laser. And so I was convinced that it would work. I mean, it was something that had never been done before and never been built, never used. So a lot of people had questioned whether it will, will ever work. It was something totally new that was pushing the normal laser, which normally uh, gives visible or infrared light, a little bit of UV light, down to a region, the X-ray wavelengths, where people have been trying to build uh, X-ray laser exactly for the reason I was saying before, this mm -hmm. capability of exploring matter at the angstrom femtosecond level. And in particular, there had been a lot of work at Livermore in the 70s and 80s, because they also had in mind uh, military applications. And it was very hard to build conventional X-ray, conventional, I mean, uh, X-ray laser similar to the normal lasers, visible lasers, because they were requiring an incredible amount of energy to uh, pump the laser, as we say in the laser uh, jargon. With the laser, you had to provide light uh, that will produce, uh, will modify the atomic structure inside, mm -hmm. and that will lead to the lasing action, it will lead to the laser light. In the case of an X-ray laser, the amount of energy that you needed to do that was very large. They did it at Livermore using an atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. the, the program was partly uh, funded right. by, I mean, Livermore is uh, right. a defense uh, lab. And uh, right. so they, at that time, they were still uh, having uh, explosion of atomic bombs to test the atomic weapons. And they used one of these uh, explosion to test also an, an X-ray laser following the conventional way of building a laser. Uh, it works, apparently. I mean, the work is, uh, uh, is subject to security, so we don't know many details. Uh, but apparently it works, but it's not something that you would use every day in the Bay Area. So there was the need to do something different. And uh, I was convinced that this something different was the, this different approach of using relativistic electron beams 
So having instead of an X-ray laser, an X-ray free electron laser. So there was a difference. And I proposed to uh, build this at uh, Slack because at Slack there was an accelerator, the linear accelerator, which was built in the 60s, which wasn't very much busy at that time. And um, according to my calculation, it was the ideal uh, source of this electron beam that could power an X-ray free electron laser. So I did this proposal in uh, 92. And it took a long time to convince people that uh, it would really work and to get funding. In the meantime, we continued our work at Los Angeles at UCLA to demonstrate that it should really work uh, mm -hmm. to get support. And finally, uh, LAC accepted this uh, proposal and DOE accepted the proposal. They started giving money in the beginning of the new century. And by 2009, it started working exactly as we predicted. So see you predicted. at that time, it has been uh, doing a lot of work, finding many new things and really opening up a new field. Absolutely. You're also a humanist and historian and an expert on uh, Galileo. Um, our viewers can find the link here below, uh, below in the uh, videos comment uh, of a very interesting presentation by Claudio called um, Seeing the Invisible Galileo Music Art and an Evolutionary Step. So what did you learn from Galileo that could be helpful to your students? Well, uh, way of doing physics, first of all, that's the most important thing. Galileo was really, is like a colleague. When you read these old books, many times uh, there are a little bit of problems in following uh, what they are trying to say because the way people thought at that time and the way they wrote at the time is somewhat different from what we do now. In the case of Galileo, it's very, it's very easy to, if you take one of his most famous book, the Sideros Nuncius, where he announced his discovery of the planets, uh, the, the satellites of Jupiter and all these astronomical discoveries. It's very easy to read because he, he really thinks in a very modern way. And it's like talking to a colleague in the in the faculty, in the faculty club. So he, he was a very good writer. His Italian is uh, really uh, very good. And my particular interest was in finding how uh, he did his work, I mean, why he did this work, which was so new uh, at that time. And I came in reading about his work and uh, learning about what he did, his family, his history. Uh, it was it became clear to me that uh, he did what he did because he was living and was part of the culture of Florence. And by culture of Florence, I mean the culture at that time in uh, music. His father was a famous musician. Uh, in uh, literature and in uh, and in art, he was uh, a friend of many of the painters active in Florence at that time. According to his first biographer, for some time he thought of becoming a painter uh, instead of a mathematician, a scientist. <clears throat> so he was part of this cultural life which involved uh, literature, music, uh, and 
visual uh, visual arts paintings in particular and he knew all the people that were active in that field that was the time when opera was born in florence the first opera was written and that was in part because of galileo's father uh, who was part of a group in florence the camerata fiorentina that was trying to make a different music to change the way music was done if you think of music from the renaissance and then you think of music in the 17th century with Monteverde, all the operas that are being uh, written is totally different. And that was partly a big part. Uh, Galileo's father, Vincenzo, played a big role into that change. And uh, in fact, he did some experiments to demonstrate that he was a theoretician, he also played the lute and other instruments. And um, he, he did some experiments to demonstrate that this theory of music uh, was right and the old Pythagorean theory of music, which was the dominant form at that time was wrong in some details, but was they were important details. And apparently the son, Galileo, participated in this experiment. So he was introduced to the experimental methods to analyze an experiment with mathematics, all very important steps in what he did uh, through music. And this culture in Florence of wanting, I mean, trying to make new things as Galileo changed science. He really started modern science. So his father started modern music. The, the, the first opera was written by a member of this group, the Camerata Fiorentina. And so there was all these activities that were going on and uh, he was able to use his knowledge of painting to understand what he was looking through the microscope, through the telescope. So there are all these yeah, connections exactly. between different kinds of culture and what he did. I mean, and, yeah, my question here is that you do encourage an interdisciplinary approach to life. Indeed, in talking about Galileo, you said how um, using his knowledge of uh, painting light and shadows, he was uh, able to see that the moon had um, mountains and craters, right? And that Venus moves around the earth um, um, around the sun and not the earth. Yeah, so yeah. the arts are essentials to understand the physical world around us. So yeah. is the, is that still a case today? What's, who, I think what so. Is the I think that, uh, you cannot separate what we I mean. You can probably, but it's not good to separate. Uh, the humanistic culture from the scientific culture. I think we should uh, renew this connection between the two. Because with science, uh, we can understand how the how nature works. But then we need to use this knowledge to understand what is our role in this universe, in this world. And for that, the, you, you don't get that answer from science. A science gives you the way to understand how things work, how this molecule change when you shine light on it. But it doesn't tell you how to use your vision to appreciate beauty or to, uh, to run your life. So we really need this connection, especially now, uh, because things are becoming so critical in many areas and we need science to uh, really avoid the catastrophe. Uh, I mean, the big effects of the climate change, the, all these changes due to the fact that there are so many people now 
we had a big impact on uh, Nashville. And, and uh, we, with science, we can understand what we are doing to Nashville. We can understand how these changes are taking place. But we cannot decide what to do about it. And in fact, we are not. In most cases, we are not. We are refusing to decide. I mean, we, we are not really. Uh, so we, we need all the help that we can get um, to look at the whole problem uh, and use our scientific knowledge in a way which is good for humanity and for our future on this planet. Is there a Galileo in our era? Who would that Sorry, be? Is there a Galileo? Who would it be the Galileo of today? Oh my God! Of of this century? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, the past century there were really a number of great uh, scientists, and uh, science has made so so much progress. It's changed the way we look at the world in so many ways from the, our understanding of the evolution of the universe, our understanding of the structure of matter, our understanding of life. I mean, uh, when I was born, no one knew about DNA and now we use it in the court uh, to administer justice. It's uh, there have been so many big changes, and uh, I don't see, uh, but our, for most people in the, most human beings, they don't realize that these changes have taken place. There are, there are still a lot of people that do not accept for various reasons, uh, scientific, uh, I mean, religious uh, reason or other reason, or just because it's too much for them, uh, that we are not at the center of the universe. We are in a small planet around a small sun in one of one out of billions of galaxies. Um, the old, idea that we are at the center of the universe, which was the dominant idea before the time of Galileo and Copernicus and so on, is totally disappeared. But uh, while the whole world was represented in the Divine Comedy <laughs> very well, there is nothing equivalent now for the new world. We understand so much, but we have not been able to translate that into uh, our culture. There is this I think you man. said we need a new guide. To well, we, we need Dante. to make a collective effort. I mean, it's not simply a question of a mm. uh, few very good people, a few geniuses. We need to uh, make a collective effort to take what is important from science and to start taking, I mean, not only the knowledge, but the way science has, uh, has been so successful, while the scientific progress has been so important, is because of a method, a way of thinking which is accepted by all scientists. So we, we don't care who says something, we, we look at the data, and if something that Newton has told is uh, wrong, it's wrong. We, we don't complain about it, we accept it. In fact, if we can show that some of the great scientists were wrong, we are very happy. <laughs> It's part of science. Yeah. We don't, I mean, it's what they teach you when you uh, study to become a scientist, that you want to find new things to, and if you can find that uh, something that was believed true up to that point uh, is wrong, that's great. It doesn't matter who, who said it. It could be the most important man, but uh, if it's wrong, it's wrong. 
And this is normally the way people think in other areas, in all the rest of the human activities. People don't think that way. And they don't like to look at the facts and accept the facts or they, their idea. So I think we need to transfer this way, at least in part, this way of looking or this way of thinking that comes from science to the rest of humanity. And we need to take from the rest of humanity what is, is good about it, the arts and so on, and move it to the scientists. We need this transfer. It's very important at this point. But it must be a collective effort. It's a... Let's change subject and let's talk about ISNAF. Um, how and why did you become with ISNAF? And what would you think um, it's the most important role that he has played so far? Well, it can... Uh, uh, ISNAF has been very successful, I think, in uh, connecting people, uh, scholars, scientists, uh, uh, entrepreneur, I mean, uh, uh, connecting them and so helping them to in their activity, in their work. It's been very successful in uh, helping young people coming here. I mean, uh, students, when they, even before they finish, their studies or just after finishing their studies, they like to move. I think it's good for them and for everybody if they move a little bit, they spend some time in another country in a, where things are a little bit different. Uh, but they, when they do this, they also need some help to uh, be introduced in the, the new country, in the new system. Uh, and so ISNAF has been very successful in doing that. I hope that uh, in the future, ISNAF will also play a role in what uh, I was just saying, connecting the Italian scientific, technical, uh, industrial community in this country, in the US, with the rest of the Italian people living here, there are a lot of Italians who are not scientists, they are not industrialists, but they've been living here for a long time. There are many associations that uh, they have formed to maintain the idea of being Italian, the spirit that characterized the Italians. And I think the ISNAF can play a role in connecting these different communities, these different organizations, and trying to help in uh, establishing some common ground. Uh, I don't think much has been done in that area until now, but I hope that it will be done uh, in the future. During a seminar on Tushek, you had the idea for the um, Isna Bruno Tushek Award for Research in Elementary Particle Physics. Um, this award is for young investigators. Yes. So can you comment on your role of mentor and uh, advisor? And, and what do you think are the most important challenges of today's uh, young scientists in your field? Uh... Well, I mean, when I moved to, for part of my life, I worked in uh, national labs like Brookhaven or Slack, but I also spent a long time uh, at uh, UCLA being a professor, so teaching, having graduate students, and so mentoring them through this process of uh, learning how to be an active scientist doing research. And, and, and I really like that. Mm. I continue to have PhD students from UCLA even after 
I uh, retired from UCLA and moved up here. And uh, it's always a pleasure to meet again one of these uh, old students and see how they do. Uh, I have uh, students at Berkeley who are now in different position here at Slack and uh, I follow their careers with great pleasure. So that's, uh, I also mentored, uh, now I stopped taking graduate student because Usually for a PhD, one needs at least five years. And uh, it's too long for me. Uh, so uh, I miss it, but uh, I think it's reasonable to. But I also took some students coming from uh, Italy or also from some other universities here for summer. Uh, summer periods, summer internships. And it's always a pleasure to work with young people, see how they learn. Uh, they ask good questions. So it's a way of remaining active. It's good for them, but it's good for me. <laughs> so I like to do it. Let's finish with Italy. What are your current connections uh, with Italy and uh, what do you most enjoy when you go back there? What I most enjoy about Italy? When you go back, yeah. <laughs> well, I went back in October to see my family. Uh, I didn't go for two years during the COVID time and uh, it was a long time. I, really, I missed it. So I like to go back to see family and friends, to see something that I've not seen before. There are so many things in Italy to, to see. I can write a long list of places where I would like to go, <laughs> even now, where I've not been. Um, and of course, there are all the uh, professional connections of my colleagues from uh, from the time I was a student in Rome, and we have kept in touch uh, for many years. I still have some collaboration with some of them. Uh, I mean, going to Italy is always great. It's uh, so many good things to do. It's. Uh, it, I don't think it's uh, it's pretty evident. <laughs> so, uh, of course, there are problems with the way things are going. There are always be problems. There are problems here. Uh, so, there isn't a perfect country, but uh, there are many things that I enjoy in Italy, from art to the way of living, friends. Relatives. Absolutely. In fact, that my grandson is now studying in Milan at least for one semester. It's very nice, and he likes Milan. He keeps telling me uh, he had been mostly to Rome before, so for him, Milan is a discovery, and he is very pleased with it. So. Well, we really appreciate. Prof Claudio, your time and your insights, and I wish we had more time to continue, but <laughs> maybe we'll do a second second okay. uh, episode. <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. For thank you so much. Uh, having me, uh, it's been a pleasure. So until the next time. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay.